the people who've organized this uh, project on the 60s asked me to ask you some questions about your experience of the 60s. Um, I guess the first question is, um, when were the 60s? When did they start and when did they end? Yes. They started in 1958 and they ended in 1975. Can you explain that? Yes. Uh, they began really in California with a, uh, with a student march. And uh, then it ended in 1975, uh, again, with uh, the end of the Vietnam War. Okay, so when people say the 60s, for you, that comprehends a much bigger... 17-year period. Time period. That's right. Okay, um, so viewing audience, Dad, um, of the Lessons from the 60s project, how you arrived at uh, becoming a figure in the 1960s? Well, you become a figure really by uh, not being a figure. You're, two things happen. One is you, so, you step up to the plate and you say, you know, I'm going to do something in this situation. So you do something in that situation, but you really don't know the, the, uh, the, the end result of it, the, the, uh, where it's going to lead, but you stepped up. And that's when things really begin to change. That's when uh, the, uh, the effects are known to you personally. So, for example, uh, if you take Martin Luther King Jr., he steps up to the plate and he doesn't know what's going to happen. Uh, and he doesn't know where all this is going to lead in terms of his own life. But this is, but this is what's going to happen to him once he steps up and steps out. And all right, so well, tell people, because uh, if people don't know your biography, the basic steps of your life that led you to become um, an intellectual, an activist, the, um, the co-founder of the Institute for Policy Studies. Well, I co-founded the Institute for Policy Studies with Dick Barnett, who died a number of years ago. Uh, and the purpose of the Institute was to, uh, in fact, tell truth to power. And if you look at the walls of the Institute, there's not one truth, there are many truths. You have to be in a position to be able to tell many truths. And that requires a place to be able to do that and a place to protect and aid uh, uh, to keep it going. And so that was one piece of, the, of this whole story. Uh, that was in 1963? Three, yeah. It depends. You can look at 62, 63, but that's 1963, exactly. And so the Institute now will celebrate its 50th anniversary and continues with many different things having happened to it, to the people. Break-ins uh, by the government, assassinations uh, that had occurred by uh, uh, the Pinochet people. Uh, the result was deaths of, of colleagues, people very young, a 25-year-old young woman who was killed. Uh, she was your assistant, yes, Ronnie Moffat. Exactly. Uh, Ronnie Moffat, who was my assistant, and she was killed. And uh, so it caused all sorts of turmoil. And one of the questions was, how do you defend the Institute during a period of turmoil, during this period? All right, so just to finish up on your own kind of professional odyssey, what were you doing prior founding the Institute for Policy Studies? Before the Institute, I worked uh, in the White House as a member of what was called the Special Staff of the National Security Council. And I worked for a man whose name was McGeorge Bundy. 
and he was the senior advisor at that time. Uh, and so I worked for him and uh, also worked uh, as a member of the, a science group which gave advice to the government and that uh, to, to the White House. And there uh, I left because, in part, because of the war in Vietnam, I, the war in Vietnam, knowing that that's what was coming, that it was clear that this was a, a, a terrible, a terrible error mm -hmm. that was happening. Did you try to speak out within the White House against the yeah. developing war? Yeah, I spoke out against uh, against it, and uh, how was that received? Well, you know, I was very young. Uh, relatively young. I joined the White House when I was 26, I was just 26. And uh, I was there in, the, in that place from 26 to 28, 29, something like that. And in there, I did many different things. A major thing that I did, which was, um, uh, there was a fellow whose name was Carl Kazin, and Carl was the deputy advisor to, the uh, deputy national security advisor at that time. He had come from Harvard, he was very smart, and uh, he and I had a very complicated relationship uh, because and, I, and indeed, I didn't speak to him after what I'm about to tell you, after uh, he um, had done something that uh, bothered me enormously, in which I said, if we do that, what gives you the idea that we're any different than those people who measured people for the uh, gas ovens? And he and I stopped talking to each other for 35 years. I could and see how that would put a chill on the relationship. What? Yeah, I could see how that might have a chilling effect on your <laughs> friendship. Well, this was in reference to Vietnam? This was in reference to, yeah, it was in, that was in reference to uh, Vietnam, it was in reference to a number of different things that already had happened that was just piling up. It was mm -hmm. just, and he, um, he was an interesting and very, anyway, he, I had just seen him recently in the last year or two, and he stayed with us. So there was this uh, kind of half-ass reconciliation uh, and a remembrance of that period of time. So those were very bumpy days. and. Uh, I had been asked to come uh, to speak uh, about those days uh, at the um, memorial in, uh, uh, in, in Boston. Uh, For Carl Kazin? Yeah. And and it was a memorial service for Kazan, for Bundy, and mm -hmm. so forth. And uh, the memorial was predicated on the idea of how courageous they were, that they were, that they had a radical, and had hired, that Bundy had hired a radical. And I refused and said, no, you made me a radical. <laughs> and so, therefore, there was no courage involved. It was that's an accident right. on your was, part. That's right. There was, don't look to me to come to yeah. talk. So. Well, and I know to that where they described you as the conscience of the National Security Council in the Kennedy White House. Yes. And you said that that was a very dangerous thing to be. Yes, to be a conscience meant that you had no power. And... Uh, 
That, you didn't want to be the conscience of the yeah, White House. Exactly. <laughs> I had no interest in being so. You either had your own conscience, and there was none at all, but I'm not going to be powerless in this situation. Yeah. You weren't going to accept all of the burden of morality for no, them so they could go off. No, everybody <laughs> has his own, his own conscience, his own being, as it were. Yeah. But uh, to have it put into a lockbox, to use the recent term, uh, and put it someplace else, well, that was basically, to me, quite absurd. Yeah. Quite absurd indeed. So how did you end up leaving the White House then and going to create IPS? Uh, there was no future for uh, me in the White House. Uh, and uh, there's no future really for anybody, you know, in the White House. What people do once they're there is use that as a stepping stone for money or influence or power in other in other contexts later on, so that it always says in your uh, 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 obit that you were a member of the White House staff or that you were deputy this or whatever. And you, as you know, in an obit, which everyone must read, I am a very great believer in the reading of obituaries and in preparation for what it is that your obituary is going to say. And you learn a very great deal about everybody's life and American life and world life by reading how is it that people spend their lives? What is it that they do in, in their lives? And so in this, uh, uh, in this case, I was concerned, would I get a Nobel Prize? Uh, would, uh, would I be known as somebody who was active with Dr. Spock in what was called the Spock trial? Where was I going to be in the list of names? Would it go Spock, <laughs> Coffin, Raskin? <laughs> you know, how are they going to present me in all of that? So I was very aware of that. And indeed, uh, commend to your attention obituaries always have that <laughs> okay. in, in mind. But don't get overwhelmed by them. Just read you know, read them. See the way people live and who they are. Okay. I'm doing as a as a boy and a young man. Well, uh, well I uh, was raised as a in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Now Milwaukee, Wisconsin is a very important place. It's thought of as a backwater to Chicago. But Milwaukee has its own character. And if you watch films a great deal, as I do, it always says he was from Milwaukee. That's a line in, in various movies. People come from Milwaukee. Don't go back to Milwaukee. <laughs> you certainly come, didn't. <laughs> but they come from Milwaukee. Yeah. Right. So that's, that's there. Uh, while um, there, I uh, was, it was discovered that I had absolute pitch, which I still, of course, do. And w what that means, you know, many people have relative pitch. And absolute pitch means that you can always be on pitch. So if you go C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, 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 you always hit C. Or you hit C, C sharp, D, D sharp. So you know that. Well, this was very exciting to have as a child to be able to do that. I mean, that's better than having a, a circus performer <laughs> at home, right? So that was a piece. And you were playing the piano. Yes. And I began playing when I was four. Now, this is a very complicated story because I was really extraordinarily good. And I um, went to uh, study at, uh, at Juilliard. And, and a, as a, a special student 
there at Juilliard. Now, the interesting thing about musicians, if, if you read their lives, you see that most musicians, most pianists, do not give concerts all the way through the year. They play uh, X number of concerts and they teach the rest of the time. Because to live out of a suitcase is no great, no great life. And if you look, for example, at, uh, at others, uh, like, for example, Franz Liszt, who is you know, viewed as the uh, modern pianist, he played only in public until he was 35. And then he went into a monastery. So uh, th that's a, it's a very interesting world. And you can just pr plot that with other people. For example, if you take uh, um, um, Vladimir Horowitz, who was the most profound technician of our period, pianist, uh, unbelievable uh, pianist in that sense, uh, he left after 12 years. You know, and he had married uh, Toscanini's daughter uh, and uh, left after 12 years. And the, the charge was that he was gay and this and that, whatever. But the point is that he was an extraordinary showman but he left and mm -hmm. so forth. So, and you, you were a pianist? I was trained as a concert piano. So I went to, to Juilliard to study. And um, at that time, one of the places where you could go was Juilliard or the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia. <coughs> and the Curtis Institute is still there for that purpose. Of learning the piano or learning uh, an instrument and it's uh, full freight they cover all of your expenses and the money originally comes from the Curtis Publishing Company mm -hmm. which was very important over the years uh, I w went there to play and there were two great teachers of that time one was Rosina Levine from Juilliard, and uh, the other was Isabel Vengerova. And Vengerova was a frightening looking woman who weighed maybe 350 pounds. She was serious. And Rosina was frightening for all sorts of other reasons. And I was 16, and I came to Juilliard, and then went to Curtis to play, and I saw her, and I played. And the Russian teachers of that time, in order to test you, would always play beat off the beat to see if you could stay on the beat. So if it's this, they they like that, to throw you off. And indeed, it's a very frightening, frightening experience mm -hmm. for 16 year old and, and so I ran back from Curtis to, uh, to, to Juilliard, Juilliard to, mm -hmm. to the uh, train station all the way back. Now, in those days, as still, Children have uh, no rights with their parents. So their mail is constantly open. Got to check on the <laughs> child, who's the child having pot with, who's the child sleeping with, you know, whatever. You know, you got to know what's going on every minute. And that was true, of course during that period as well. And during that period, uh, may she rest in peace, my mother would open my mail 
and she would open uh, my brother's mail, who's 11 years older than I. And just to give you a flavor of that period, still, uh, my brother was a, a very great hero, in, in fact, in many, many ways, and was a, a captain in, in the Air Force and this and that, and so forth, a bombardier navigator. But in World War Two, in World War Two, but when he received word from the government, uh, my mother hid the letter. No, what? <laughs> That's what you're supposed to do. You got something from the government, you hide the letter because it may be a problem. And that's what happened in, in that case. In, 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 in my case, when I came back, uh, I was told by uh, my, uh, I was waiting for the letter. Which letter? From Curtis Institute. Oh. Saying, you know, whatever happened to that letter? And my mother said, uh, oh, you didn't get in. And my brother at that time said, what gives you the idea you didn't get in? So that's always been a mystery <laughs> as to who, what, what it meant. And the reason that, that she was against it was that she ran into a pianist uh, who was playing, a, who was a wonderful pianist, whose name was Frank Glazer from Milwaukee. But he was doubling at that time as a superintendent in the building, as, uh, as a super. And she realized that there was nothing, there's going to be no future as a pianist. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so just we you go to the University of Chicago, you go to the University of Chicago Law School. Right. Um, you end up going to work in Washington for Congressman Kastemeyer and a group of liberal congressmen. Yeah, for uh, uh, first uh, uh, Leonard Wolf and Bob Kastemeyer, right. And then that was when you went to the White House. Yeah. Then you left the White House and with Richard Barnett, you founded the Institute for Policy right. Studies. All right, so th that sets the table then for what these guys want to hear about, <laughs> which is... <laughs> um, what do you think we've been talking about? <laughs> uh, well, the, the, we've set the table. So now you, you think you, this is all the youth wants to know? Is that <laughs> <laughs> well, so one question is, um, you, um, you first became a leader in the anti-Vietnam War movement when you wrote the statement called A Call to Resist Illegitimate Authority yes. that was published in a number of newspapers across the yes. country. Um, that became the basis for your indictment along with Dr. Spock, William Sloan Coffin, Michael Ferber, and Mitchell Goodman in the so-called Boston Five case. Right. You know, the interesting thing about that, Jamie, was it was called, it was not called an indictment. It was an information. An information. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, so okay, so there was an information filed against you guys. You were not. You were not arrested. You were never arrested, but the information was filed against you. How did you learn that you had been brought up on these charges? How did you first learn of the indictment? In in Washington, that I used to go to, uh, and uh, a. In, in a hotel, uh, and on the radio, it, it came across on the, on the radio, or at that time, it's television as, as well. That, that I had been, uh, that the information was presented that Dr. Spock had been indicted, as they put it, mm -hmm. uh, with four others, mm -hmm. and there were pictures then in the New York Times. And uh, in the post, you know, across the country. So you guys were charged with conspiracy to aid and abet draft evasion. Um, That's right. Did the five defendants know each other? No, not not really. Uh, 
the lawyers kind of, one or two of the lawyers knew each other, the ACLU lawyers knew each other in the case. But the people you were accused of engaging conspiracy with, really, you didn't know? No, not really. Yeah. Not really. Had you met Dr. Spock before? Uh, Spock came to the house. But was that, wasn't that afterwards that you became friends with him? He came to the house, and my recollection, Jim, you'll remember this, is uh, he... Um, I had an injury that he took care of for me. He yeah. took care of you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That you... Played. We were playing football, and I cut my hand, and he <laughs> stitched it up. But that was later, right? I don't know. I think that was later, because... Uh, that may be. That yeah. may be. But, okay, but, but all right, so... Well, describe what this call to resist illegitimate authority was about, what you had in mind the, the in writing it. The call to resist was a statement of saying... There is such a thing as legitimate authority. And legitimate, legitimate authority meant that it, in, by, uh, it included justice and law together. And where those elements were not present, then it was behooved you to resist as a citizen, as a person. Either way, as a citizen or a person, you had to say no. You, you're not part of that. And you're prepared to uh, support those who do that as well. <clears throat> and that meant that uh, there were certain things, certain elements, uh, that you had to, that a person had to uh, uh, live up to. One was, that uh, if you um, saw a person who um, was in need and you didn't resist, there was something wrong with you. So you had to be prepared to do that. The person, uh, you had to make the judgment that the person who was resisting was doing so in good conscience. So again, the conscience is not set aside, the conscience is part of the day-to-day -day life of people. And so those elements were present at that time. Because there were lots of young people who were burning their draft because cards or turning them in or refusing to participate. who were burning their draft cards or, or turning them in. Some were burning them, uh, and that was a statement uh, that, that turned out to be a very, a very interesting statement, because it meant that they were that, uh, and and here, uh, Coffin would invite people up to burn their draft cards. Well, he was the uh, chaplain at Yale University. And as the chaplain at Yale, this was a very big deal because everybody went to chapel in those days. Uh, and it was against the state, so the, the state was being burned symbolically by the church. Uh, and then there was another position, the position again remained, underneath it all, the in good conscience thing. Uh, and as you know, when you, uh, you can either uh, affirm uh, or swear. And so, you know, people affirm, they swore, whatever. But that was a very, a very big moment in American history. Mm -hmm. um, what was your experience of the trial itself in Boston? Uh, the trial, um, the trial had had many elements to it. Uh, one was uh, a, a sense of boredom. That, you know, there's a very great deal that goes on 
New Trials, that's just boring. Uh, and uh, one of the people, Ferber, uh, spent the time reading in Greek <laughs> at the trial. And uh, Coffin was burning the uh, burning the, uh, the for the churches. He the was draft cards. The, the draft cards, right? So we were seeing that, and people were trying to get next to Spock, who was everybody's baby doctor at the time. Yeah. So that was the major <laughs> thing that went on there. The other thing, of course, that happened which was very important, is that everybody who was in that trial, knowing, and, and, and this will give you a sense of the difficulty of, of trials, whether you're innocent or guilty or whatever, no one's relationship stayed, personal relationship stayed. Everyone either got divorced or separated or whatever, and the relationship ended. Mm -hmm. And so now know what it's like where people who are, in a sense, at the top rung of a society that this happens to. But imagine what this happens to people who have nothing and who lose everything at, at the same time. Mm -hmm. The um, defendants and acquitted you. Yes. And I, I looked in anticipation of this interview, I looked at a couple of the old books about this and one of them said that... Um, one said you joked about it and said you could demand a retrial in your case, but another said that you actually were devastated that I they said you were acquitted and the others were found guilty. Yeah, no, I was, I was devastated and I cried actually because, and then I was asked about it. I said, and I was asked by the various report, and I said that I felt very good for myself and terrible for the others. And my lawyers uh, were very important in this, in this case. I had the presence of mind to ask uh, a lawyer whose name was Taylor to be my lawyer. Wait, not Telford Taylor. Telford Taylor. Oh, Telford Taylor, okay, yeah. To be my lawyer. For war crimes process. Exactly. And I knew that if he was the lawyer, every time the case would be mentioned in the press, it would say the war crimes. The Nuremberg prosecutor. Prosecutor. Hmm. And that was a very important way to get the war crimes issue going. And there was, a, at that time as well, there was a book uh, that was put out called In the Name of America. And In the Name of America was put together uh, by Seymour Melman, who you may, have, may remember as a very dear and wonderful man. And he had gathered um, 300 pages of different things that had occurred that were more alleged war crimes and we were invited the five people to swap and remember different people to meet with the um, uh, deputy um, he was the deputy attorney general deputy associate attorney general about uh, You know what's our what are we what are we bothering with? Why are you bothering everybody? And we had come with two hundred and seventy draft cards. Oh, this is before the trial. This is before the investment. This is before the trial. We come with those and to present them. Now I knew that if you would bother the government, they would come after you. And Arthur Wasco, who at that time 
didn't know that he was a radical Jew or a Jewish radical, but just a nudge, said, you've got to take these. And he pounded on the table and he said, this is, you've got to take these. This is, uh, this is going to, uh, we're presenting you with evidence of a crime. And so then one of the people who was there said, I don't recognize you people here at all. I'm going back to California where I have my own community. And that's, I recognize that community, <laughs> but I don't recognize you. <laughs> and it got to me to speak. And I said, here is in the name of America, you know, what you've got to do is, is investigate. These atrocities. These atrocities. Mm -hmm. Because these are real. And those people who cause these atrocities, now you have to do something with. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so here is this case, you know, this kind of huge mess of material, mess of feelings, uh, just a mess of, of, of the time. And uh, during that period as well, uh, the question was, if they are guilty, I am guilty. That was a big, uh, a big deal. And um, th there were three pages in the New York Times of people who signed their names mm -hmm. to, ad, to ads. And those three pages were started with uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, Simon, Simone de Beauvoir, you know, very big... Martin Luther King, right? Martin Luther King, exactly. And so the people at that time who had stepped forward and they said, you know, yeah. append your name to these names and people, of course, do. All right, eventually peace movement gets stronger and stronger. Um, IPS gets investigated, broken into. You and Dick Barnett, I think Roger Wilkins, get put on Nixon's enemies list. Is that right? I don't recall uh, Rogers being on the enemies list. Mm -hmm. But you and Barnett were. Uh, Barnett and I are on the enemies list, yeah. Um, and there were undercover agents sent in to investigate you guys? Yes, there were undercover agents. There were <clears throat> something like 14 agents uh, who, were respond or who, who followed the Institute. Uh, 58 informers came to different sorts of events at the Institute. Uh, and That's then, one way to build your crowd. And that was one way. <laughs> right. And as you know, there was a, uh, that's what was called the, uh, it, was, it was like the Hoover Wing of the Communist Party. You knew that a quarter of the Communist Party was made up of the Hoover Wing. So. Um, so. The J. Edgar Hoover Wing, just to be clear. Um, what, um, so that, so then, um, okay, w w do you consider the 60s, writ large as people talk about them, a positive moment for American democracy or a negative moment? I, I view it as a positive moment, <clears throat> very much so. Why? Uh, because it was, again, it was a statement of saying that as individuals and as citizens, uh, you could resist. And there would be others there who would resist as well. And indeed, at that time, there were other movements. There was, uh, there was a, uh, a document called Resistance. That was another group that had put together a document called Resistance mm -hmm. as well. 
and then, but the call to resist turned out to be, I think, the, I say that uh, uh, with great ego, the most important. Mm -hmm. With great modesty and ego, mm -hmm. that was the most important. Um, and <clears throat> the IPS has, um, uh, under your leadership and since then, has tried to be a force not just in the question of foreign policy. IPS has been blessed with great leadership. Uh, presently with John Cavana, who is an extraordinary uh, leader and who is uh, loved by everyone at the Institute, uh, and who has a strong a, a very, very powerful uh, retentive memory as well, and a very great love of people. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, a, and a friend to everybody at the Institute as well. So that's, so we're fortunate, you know, fortunate in that sense. And um, it is, as you know, uh, the 50th anniversary, as we said, uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's called 50 Years and Preparing for the Next 50 Years. Mm -hmm. um, why do you, well, what do you think were the major successes of that period? And what were the failures and what, what could have been done differently or ought to be done differently to, to uh, ensure a more progressive future for people? Each, uh, each area, yeah, each time, uh, does not reflect on its own time. It reflects on the past. And one of the important things to do is to find a way of being self-reflexive about the moment that you're living through, which then becomes the basis upon which the next generation can build as well. And I would see that as a very important lesson uh, to be learned, which was only learned in part. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it would have allowed for coming to grips and, and with the question of how to confront, confront and protect certain people, how to take into account who was to be protected, and not an easy, not an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. Tommy, do you have any questions? No. Um, Mike Taper, you have a you question. Know, it'd be interesting to recall the different people you remember passing through IPS over the years, as teachers, as visitors. Uh, Give me a name of two of people who you would... Well, I, I remember, uh, I, I have a nice memory of Allen Ginsberg uh, being approached by Allen Ginsberg in the Xerox room. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, you know, everybody involved in activism, I always associate with IPS. Uh, well, I think that's true. I, certainly Allen Ginsberg was there. Uh, and Ralph Nader. Nader. Uh, Nader, I first uh, became in touch with him, or he with me. Uh, it was walking past our house, and he came to the door and he said, You should uh, uh, shovel your walk, somebody's going to fall. <laughs> and and hurt. Himself. <laughs> so you better come out here and do that. So that was the first introduction to unsafe at any sidewalk <laughs> yeah. or unsafe at any speed. <laughs> yeah. How, but you could, you knew that he would never use speed. <laughs> it was just unsafe at any speed. <laughs> so of course it's true. I mean, the about the institute was huge number of people who came through. Uh, there, were, there was a fellow who um, worked for many years at the New York Times, who was a student 
uh, SDSer, and he came and he would use the old uh, crank machine uh, and run off stuff at the Institute. And he's just recently retired from the New York Times. I mean, there are all sorts of people. You know, some of the spin-offs from IPS, Jeff Foe was involved in a, uh, a spin-off, for yes. instance. I mean, the whole theory that I had of the incident was that uh, if you would get too big, you would start something else. Because what you were undertaking to do was not only build a, uh, an institute, but develop a culture. Mm -hmm. And spin-offs would lead to that culture. And each place would have an institute and got too big, it would lead, it would move to the next step. So that was the story. Mm -hmm. Impact of the women's movement <clears throat> at IPS. Can I pause for a second to change the tape before sure. I get to that question? Okay. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll say something about that. I remember Tina Smith, <clears throat> that changed. Yeah, uh, I think that's true. What about the, the, uh, the well, the women's story. thing was important because they uh, were given I'm sorry, go ahead. A, a uh, newspaper which was begun in the basement of the Institute by the women off our backs called off our backs. And that was a very important step forward for, for women, believe it or not. And then some of them left the Institute and they went off to start uh, their own places at universities uh, and uh, to become head of different Thing. One was very Christian. Marietta Wicks. No, it was not she. But in any case, there were different people who had their own, their own thing. Hmm. So, well, um, Esther suggested, um, which is um, to reflect on how the era of the 1960s affected you personally. Uh, both the transformations, the social transformations you were part of, but also the conflict with the government and the, invest, the constant investigations and surveillance. And so well, as I mentioned earlier, there was, um, everybody who was on trial ended up in a divorce situation. Uh, or that that was something that had occurred to to the people at that to that time, uh, and uh, it was there was a very heavy um, burden which was then carried. Yeah, and there was little to be said beyond that, except again to talk about this business about how to be self-reflexive enough for the time that you're living in to be able to use that as a stepping stone for the next generation to be somewhat liberated. You can't ever get quite to the top of the mountain, but you don't have to fall quite as far down. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a whole other it's a whole other story. Terrific. Anything on relationship with Dick Barnett? Work together for such a long time. Well, uh, let's let's just do, do one final thing then about that. Let's talk about your friends because you've had right. great friends through your political work: Richard Barnett and Roger Wilkins and Barbara Ehrenreich and Gar Alperovitz and right. Cy Hirsch and. Yeah these, Nader and yeah, these are all people who were part of our lives. And just to close with uh, saying something about Dick. Uh, 
Dick was a very, a terrific writer. And one of his great books was uh, Roots of War, which many people still read, or if they don't, should. It's a very important and very useful book. Uh, and he, but when he died, before he died, he was very ill and uh, suffered from Alzheimer's, which was a great, a great, great shock. And then he died. And um, Anne Burnett should be talked to about some of that and about, she's written a book on border crossings to look at that book and mm -hmm. Great. talk about that. All we right. should do the date of the interview. Today is um, January 7th. 2013. And you didn't say who you were talking to. We're talking to Marcus Raskin, and I'm Jamie Raskin, his son. Okay. And this is Tommy Raskin, my son. Um, for the purposes of editing later, do you mind presenting yourself, saying your name, and, and who you are? Presenting what? Presenting yourself, so saying say your, your name, name. and, and who you Marcus are. Marcus Raskin. I propose that you close by filming my dad play the piano. What do you oh, think? Yeah, Sounds great. <coughs> Absolutely. Why don't we do that? Is yeah. that all right, Dad? Are you up there? Yeah, that's okay. okay. Let's see.
You're still a child prodigy, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> so did you force this upon Jamie? Did he have any music? He's fantastic. No, no, no. You have Tommy play with him. Fantastic. Oh. stuff, including um, Sir Donald Francis Tovey, who is the great expert on symphonies and chamber music and piano work and so forth and so on, and writing all that up, and then going from there into talking about Obama. That's a whole other story. Mm -hmm. 
But is there something inspiring about music that's connected to radical politics? Maybe not radical politics, but the need to speak truth. Social consciousness. Uh, speak truth to power. You know, is there a musical quality or influence to that, I wonder? I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. It's not an easy question. History of uh, cantors and rabbis? And well, there's a history of cantors, certainly. Yeah, so. So were you, were you raised Orthodox? Or no. Not no. at all? No. no. Oh, but here, th this was the. This is interesting. <laughs> to put together the yes, three of different course. things. It's <laughs> your <Sure>. protest song. <laughs> I got that. The first one, what was the first one? Well, this is uh, the Chacon, Bach Chacon. Uh, that was, I, I feel like you answered Michael's question. Texas. Yeah.